thank you very much, uh, Omar and Leslie, and uh, thank you very much for Cooper, uh, Cooper Union. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. And, um, and thank you also, Omar, for accepting like to change the format a bit, because as you mentioned briefly, um, I felt that uh, in uh, one way or another, it's a continuation of our fragmented conversation. I think uh, this started in Beirut uh, years ago, uh, and then in Berlin, and uh, I felt that uh, it's growing naturally, and I felt that because of the previous conversations and because of what I think that uh, um, few things that uh, connected each uh, both of us, like in terms of practice and how also we approach uh, certain things, I felt that this would be um, even more, not just more inspiring for me, even more encouraging and even more challenging, which I felt that also hopefully would be beneficial for uh, our audience, who I'm happy to also be engaged with later. Uh, now to your question. Um, yes, uh, indeed, these two themes, uh, memory and justice, I think I became more or less obsessed with them in the past few years. Start with memory, and I have to say that um, um, I think the turning point was uh, when there was a clearer signs that our dream of change in Syria and uh, maybe beyond in the Arab region was crushed brutally. Uh, brutally. Uh, the, ch the change that, the dream that started in Tunis end of 2010 and then uh, the, the domino effect like Egypt, Syria, Yemen, uh, uh, Libya and elsewhere actually, uh, these uprisings against uh, uh, dictatorships, authoritarian oligarchy, oligarchy regimes started in these countries. And um, that, uh, I would say, short spell of hope was uh, unfortunately uh, and tragically uh, soon crushed uh, uh, by the counter-revolutionary force, by the regimes and their supporters across the world, regionally and internationally. And by lack also of uh, what I consider a serious lack of solidarity uh, also uh, internationally. Uh, anyway, so um, when the dream was crushed and when uh, again, there were clearer signs that um, um, the regime in Syria uh, would prevail despite the um, horrible atrocities, that well-documented atrocities, by the way, and human rights violations. And the fact that uh, when you look today at the reality, uh, you see that the regime with, with, with these documented atrocities looks uh, more immune even than 10 years ago when the uprising in Syria started 2011, March 2011. Uh, and then, of course, you start to feel that uh, the struggle today is not just a political struggle or even military struggle, which actually the majority of Syrians didn't really want to in engage in in the first place, but also it's struggle of narrative. It's a struggle of uh, um, struggle and uh, by Syrians who uh, are uh, defeated and displaced today who live in either inside Syria or outside Syria in um, kind of dire situations. They feel that uh, they are also threatened by uh, another kind of very cruel uh, fact that their memory, their version of history is also about to be erased. And here we are speaking about two layers. First is just the time the time and uh, complexity of events, which uh, with good or bad intentions, regardless, make a lot of people now uh, uh, either forget or ignore how things started and uh, or even to put things out of context. And what I mean by that is that when you, uh, the, most of the literature you read today about Syria, and I'm speaking about the uh, news and the media, because they are the dominant platforms, of course, and because they are more or less uh, the platforms that create um, the narrative about Syria today, you rarely come across to any decent analysis that put things within context and that really uh, 
put things in chronological order and 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 uh, and and remind people about how things unfolded and how that the whole thing started by a peaceful revolution uh, started spontaneously actually by people especially in the uh, poorer areas in the outskirts of the big cities against uh, a very brutal dynasty uh, the Assadic. Uh, everything you come across is uh, uh, speaking about war, civil war, speaking about two uh, opponents, regime and the Islamist, uh, Daesh and the radicals. Uh, so this is one layer. The other very dangerous layer in my opinion is also the uh, constant uh, attempt by, by, by the regime, which is the victorious party on the ground today, backed by almighty forces regionally or internationally like Russia and Iran to systematically actually erase this narrative, the narrative of Syrians who revolt you know, and who are today uh, mostly displaced inside or outside Syria or uh, living in uh, still, uh, uh, and, and, uh, under fear where the regime is still uh, controlling uh, land. Uh, uh, and, and, and this systematic, uh, how to say, attempt to erase the narrative, I am afraid to say that it's successful with time. It's successful internally and it could be successful also externally. And we have, uh, I think, witnesses, even from within Syria, I have to say, uh, to how the regime... Uh, can actually uh, manipulate or even hide facts with time. Uh, and what scares me, for example, when I uh, think about younger generation who either were not born or were very young when the whole thing started in Syria or the uprising and the peaceful revolution started. And I think about what kind of curriculum today they are like, you know, uh, exposed to, what kind of education they're exposed to. Uh, this is a really a scary fact because there is, of course, you can easily expect that there is only one version of history or one version of narrative that is imposed. Again, this is not just internally. I think the Russian uh, media machine is strong and is also tireless, actually, in trying to work on that, not just inside Syria, but also outside Syria. So briefly, there are multiple layers how, with time, uh, the, the, the story of the defeated, let me put it in this way, uh, the story of those who their dream of change was crushed brutally is seriously threatened of being erased. And I cannot think about a more tragic destiny than this one because I think, or I tend to believe, or maybe I would like to believe that as long as you have a story, you are not totally defeated. As long as you have a voice, you are not totally defeated. I mean, I can just borrow um, uh, the wonderful collection of essays and uh, articles that were collected by a book by Ala Abdel Fattah from his prison cell in Egypt uh, under the title, You Are Not Yet Been Defeated or something like that. Sorry for maybe I'm you, missing. You have, you have not yet been defeated. You have not been defeated. And Ala is my generation. Ala is a comrade. Uh, who uh, was also, uh, um, how to say, uh, an, an, an essential figure in the uprising in, the e in Egypt, and he was known anyway for his uh, for his activism against the consecutive uh, regimes in Egypt, even before the Egyptian Revolution, but mostly, of course, during and after. And uh, this title that Allah chose for his. Uh, collection of essays and this book that was recently, by, by, by the way, published in English uh, is another, I think, um, reminder that uh, regardless of uh, our position, regardless of how weak are today, and we have to acknowledge our position, we have to be frank in acknowledging our position today politically. But regardless of that, uh, or despite this acknowledgement, acknowledgement, sorry, not regardless, I think as long as we are able to narrate uh, 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 and to tell and to retell, it's we are not yet defeated. Uh, or, uh, and based on that, for me, the question of memory became more and more important. The question of uh, of, of a narrative became more and more in, in, uh, important. And therefore, it became also, a, 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 how to say, a strong theme 
that I tackle through my work, which is, of course, uh, theater. I will stop here. So because I, I can, yeah, uh, I maybe to give time for other things. Yeah. Sure. And I should um, say something I didn't say, which is that we we have some images from different productions of several of your plays and that we will be sharing them as we go. Uh, if you decide to refer to a play or another as an example. I, I, I actually, uh, because you mentioned that, uh, just I will start from the last play. As I say, that, I mean, for me, this I, I was busy with this question for years now, but I think for me, it became more and more urgent in the past two years where uh, first, of course, you have kind of a, a cycle of 10 years almost uh, came to an end, the 10 years of the start of the Arab revolutions or what's so-called the Arab Spring. And, and this kind of, um, uh, sad, I mean, I would say maybe necessarily, but also kind of sad acknowledgement that uh, uh, that we are kind of uh, weaker today, uh, much weaker, of course, and the hope is more scarce and 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 uh, and, uh, and more rare today. And I think that uh, was a main drive behind writing that the piece, Damascus, two thousand forty-five, in which I uh, actually jump to the future to examine this question of of history and narrative, uh, in which I. Um, I go more, um, how to say, in creating a very fictional and very imaginary situation in the future where I uh, draw a very, uh, I would say, uh, fantastic picture of Syria in the future, Syria that is flourishing, Syria, Damascus that is um, uh, becoming a, a role model even uh, as a city in the region for economical growth and for uh, a fantastic, uh, uh, process of uh, reconstruction and uh, it's even leading economical force Syria in that time future again it's a, just imagine situation but all of that actually is built on um, how to say a manipulated history or manipulated narrative and in the in the in the play I examine this I, I examine how you can maybe be successful in uh, uh, burying the truth or in imposing as a victorious, uh, imposing your uh, version of history, which is actually unfortunately happened. It's not a, a Syria in this regard. It's not a, a unique case through the history. Uh, nevertheless, in the play, I maybe because I want that, I want to believe that there will be cracks that will happen in this imposed history, regardless of how, uh, uh, how solid it is and how... Um, cleverly and uh, successfully authoritarian regimes could impose this narrative. I do believe that uh, cracks will find ways. And then actually, at some point, um, uh, things will start to collapse again. And uh, because I, again, still uh, strongly believe that it's impossible to, as long as people are determined, of course, to keep their story alive, it's impossible even, uh, uh, even, I mean, facing almighty powers, it's impossible to allow your, your story to be totally erased. So in the play actually, that now we see big pictures, I'm also not just examining the, uh, the, this question, but I'm also examining the, role actually of uh, institutions like museums, universities, in kind of, uh, in uh, imposing uh, uh, one narrative or in kind of, of turning one version of history to the official history, because also this is something I'm afraid of. Uh, because the main, for example, space or in the play, uh, it's the, a museum, a virtual a museum that I imagine, a museum that doesn't exist now in Damascus, but I imagine that this museum that is established by the authority in uh, the new Damascus, the new Syria that again is uh, economically booming. And this specific museum that was created actually to uh, uh, boost the propaganda or the official narrative, in this museum specifically the cracks will have or start to happen. And this way, I also, uh, of course, was, uh, I, um, no doubt, I was, of course, uh, uh, influenced by uh, the recent events, uh, 
mainly, of course, by the uh, Black Lives Matter and, and, and uh, everything that happened and uh, with and after, uh, by, the, uh, by the serious questions of the role of monuments, of course, and the discussion that, of course, happened uh, 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 because of that, uh, about the role of museums and, of course, the questions about certain collections in, in European or Western museum and so on and so forth. So all of these, I think, questions that uh, really occupy me today, I kind of, uh, how to say, throw them in a, a story that's happening in the future. Uh, uh, to, to in, in practice, I was examining something that really very relevant in to, uh, for me today. So it's, it's in the present time. But I kind of jump to the future to give me more freedom in, in, in examining these topics. Again, the topics of memory and topics of history and who writes history and, uh, and who deletes history. And also the question of the role of monuments and institution, including by the way, art institution, sometimes in, in helping uh, authorities emphasizing their own uh, or their version of, of, of uh, history that with time becomes the only history or the one history or the official history. Thank you. And linked to um, this question of memory or especially in the way that you framed it is is the question of justice, as I mentioned. I mean, one could speak about narrative justice in the light of, of what you just said, for instance. Uh, but of course, justice is a much, um, is also a, a much larger and very fundamental question in a place that has had um, an extraordinary number of, of deaths and an extraordinary number of people who have been forced to leave the country um, over the years. Um, I was wondering in that light, what, how do you think of, of a term or of a notion like justice? Uh, and, and has your thinking about justice changed over the years of, of, um, of living as a, a Syrian uh, person uh, in different places and of observing the situation from near or far? And of course, how how does theater, how do, how do you, in terms of theater, deal with this? Yeah, um, uh, again, I mean, this, I think, beside memory, uh, was and still uh, a topic that I'm, I'm really, um, I would say, um, thinking a lot about. And, um, and yes, p p responding to your question, I myself went through phases of understanding and uh, the meaning of justice and uh, and of of how to say um, of uh, maybe having different expectations uh, from the from from justice not just from uh, from its legal aspect also actually uh, exploring its maybe ethical and philosophical aspects uh, the of of this term of, of this topic uh, naturally like many I think. Uh, um, the call for justice was was essential uh, in the early days of the revolutions across the Arab world and, and in Syria. Uh, I mean, and and that was a thing that we do, we wouldn't compromise about. But I should I think gradually also we realized that we don't have one definition for justice. And actually, even I would say that if you ask ten Syrians today. Uh, about justice, I'm pretty sure you'll get 10 different definitions of what their expectation of justice and what their definition of justice and how do they see, what is, uh, well, how do you see, how do they see uh, ju uh, justice uh, achieved today? Uh, mainly because um, I think in the times of uh, huge upheavals, uh, like the one that's happening in Syria, um, a lot of, um, I would say, doubts will surround the meaning of justice. Uh, especially that in Syria, uh, the tragedy is still unfolding. It's still happening in front of our eyes while we are more or less uh, helpless witnesses, uh, witnessing uh, with, uh, 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 without unfortunately being able to uh, change facts on the ground or to kind of, um, 
um, I'd say maybe end this agony somehow. Uh, so this actually will will put justice under more dots and will create uh, frustration, will create um, uh, radical interpretations, will create um, a lot of also uh, cynic cynicism. Uh, and all of that will be uh, will be how to say embodied in our interpretations to justice. Uh, I I personally today, uh, and this is my personal opinion. Again, as I said, you ask ten Syrians today, will have different ten opinion, ten different opinions. I personally today uh, see uh, the only justice that is achievable. Is justice that includes very painful compromises, not just because, uh, not just because of the how to say for me clear fact that there is no justice actually uh, that can bring those who uh, lost their life. We are speaking about hundreds of thousands of innocents who lost their life. Uh, not just because uh, there is no justice that can how to say reward or or give any meaningful compensation for those who were detained for years and tortured, or for those who were displaced or those who lost everything. Uh, but even on more practical terms, I think what evil regimes like the Syrian regime managed to do, unfortunately successfully, is that through decades, and we are speaking about the regime in Syria, just a reminder for our audience that uh, it's been in power since 1970. So we are speaking about like uh, have a century, you know, of, of 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 the rule of one family of a dynasty, and what these regimes uh, uh, and we have to give the credit to Assad regime did perfectly is to uh, through the time to uh, create a sophisticated uh, system where many are willingly or unwillingly involved in practices of corruption, of spying on others, of informing sometimes on your neighbors, your friends, and even in torture. So how, how do you achieve uh, accountability when you face, on your, when you try to deconstruct such an evil, sophisticated network? Uh, just, to, I know that comparisons are not very uh, precise in this context, but like, uh, I, because I live in Germany, and I, when I moved to Germany, I started to read more about uh, the Nazi regime and how they composed uh, and how they constructed this machine. Uh, and, I, and you cannot help but find similarities, actually, in the way that these evil regimes, regardless if they are like, uh, regardless of the ideology they adopt, that they, uh, with time, these machines be, uh, 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 becomes very strongly embodied in, 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 in how to say, um, the societies and, and uh, part of its uh, work is on routine and on, on, on uh, having employees executing uh, nasty actually works. And here also, again, uh, uh, you cannot but help about thinking about uh, the famous work of Hannah Arendt, uh, The Banality of Evil, and the title, and the title that, uh, as I think uh, you and the audience know, caused her a lot of criticism. And, and uh, back then, when the, uh, maybe her, her work was released, and, and how can you describe Eichmann, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, like using word banality. But today, I can understand uh, Hannah Arendt's work more uh, through examining the Syrian context, actually. So seeing that many uh, who were involved in atrocities or in, in uh, acts of corruption or spying or like nasty, uh, they were employees in this sophisticated network and machine that the regime created. Again, it's not to burden everybody. I think uh, uh, accountability should include everybody. But then again, this brings us to the question of justice and, uh, and how you can achieve justice when you face uh, such uh, an evil, sophisticated machine that was created through the years and that was integrated in all uh, aspects of the Syrian uh, society. Uh, related to, the, to, to how theater, I mean, can contribute, I mean, simply this is my tool. And I do believe that theater can pro provide a platform where, where these discussions 
and discussion, for example, about justice, similar to discussion about memory, can be, uh, how to say, free from restrictions of uh, the legal aspects or the, sometimes the, the, uh, the, the pure facts. I think the, the, the advantage we have in, as a theater people, a uh, theater creator, is that we can shift this discussion to a, a platform where we can, how to say, um, um, imagine situations, uh, even create situations that they do not necessarily exist today, uh, or, or uh, even mix some facts, uh, uh, solid facts with fiction to explore things that we are unfortunately unable to do today. I, I will mention an example of a work that we did uh, three years ago uh, called The Factory. And in The Factory, actually, um, uh, we, are we were tackling uh, uh, a case that are still unfolding in the French courts. Uh, uh, infamous case of uh, the uh, giant multinational French Swiss uh, cement manufacturer Lafarge, which is the biggest uh, cement manufacturer in the whole world, by the way. And their uh, scandal uh, there uh, in Syria, because they had a big factory uh, in uh, North uh, Syria that was shortly actually before the uh, revolution, short open uh, before the revolution, this huge facility, which uh, is considered the biggest foreign investment in the modern history of Syria outside the oil sector, because uh, the biggest investments are in the oil sector, but outside the sector, this was the Lafarge facility was the biggest foreign investment. And uh, briefly what happened is that after the, um, uh, revolution and then the tra tra transition from peaceful uh, revolution to the uh, armed resistance and then the war, the outbreak of the war in Syria. Of course, all uh, foreign investments or uh, facilities or factories, institution were closed and, and were closed actually by order from the government or from, for example, uh, speaking about European uh, institution or facilities by the order of European Union. Uh, and Lafarge took the decision, the administration of Lafarge, to keep the facility, the huge factory open. Uh, of course, the decision was no doubt built on, and with facts, this is support, not just this is and my assumptions, this was support by evidence, in fact, by, by the greediness of the multinational administration uh, uh, to keep the uh, factory running because they knew that cement in Syria would be the gold or the new gold for their construction that will happen sooner or later. And also because they could make business also during the war, they could still import their um, their their uh, how to say um, products you know and for that decision they ended up collaborating with all party uh, with all war parties from the Syrian regime to everybody else including IS by the way and other uh, militias so they kept bribing and and making deals and, and paying money but what was more ugly is that they left workers uh, local workers of course because they of course they withdraw foreign experts uh, European nationals and they kept the Syrian workers who were of course threatened that if they quit they will not receive nor neither compensation nor salaries uh, and what happened uh, is, of course, some of the workers were killed because the factory was in the, in the crossfire in the middle of war zone. Some were kidnapped because uh, uh, in, in this chaotic war zone, uh, some just thugs thought that, okay, by kidnapping workers, you would blackmail a very rich uh, um, uh, 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 multinational like Lafarge. Of course, Lafarge didn't, uh, uh, did, I mean, um, they didn't care about this kidnapped people, so they didn't pay any ransom or, or nothing. So a lot of, of, of horrible things happened to those workers who were forced to keep this factory open. And uh, the play is actually uh, speaking about this. But back to the point I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, in the play, we didn't just relay on, on, on facts or in documents, which was very present, by the way, in the play, but we took it further by uh, imagining also a possible justice or a possible destiny for those who were involved in, 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 in how to say, in, 
in designing this evil plan of keeping the factory open. Uh, and again, that uh, for me, um, uh, kind of, of uh, at least it gives me a clue that in theater you can uh, take this discussion uh, further or trying to examine it in a, in a different way, trying to li liberate it from the restrictions of the facts today. The, for, because uh, in reality today, to, to, to bring uh, the highly ranked people in Lafarge into justice, it's, it's proved day by day to be more and more difficult. Even though there are some progress, I have to say, it's, it's achieved in the uh, French courts against them. But because the more you dig, for example, in this story, and just this is just one simple story uh, from Syria, you discover that it's not just about uh, capital, uh, the, uh, sorry, the alliance between uh, politics and capital, but also you, you explore more involvement by politicians, and political decision makers locally and globally in such a scandal. And you realize that it's very hard, if not impossible to bring this to, uh, to hold those people accountable. But at least in theater, you can scandalize them. I would say you can at least um, um, uh, unfold these facts and you can even try to um, imagine uh, situations where bring them to kind of accountability is possible. You can provoke this debate. You can at least encourage this debate. And, and, and that's what is possible for theater. That's what is, I think, uh, the contribution that theater uh, can do um, in this regard. Can you say anything about the, what we're seeing in the images, the production, the stage? Um, yes, of course. Uh, or, or, you know, some general things about how you, you, you've staged this particular one. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this, this uh, production was co-produced by Volksbühne Theater in Berlin and the Ruhr Trinale. It's also uh, an excellent, actually, uh, uh, festival that happens in, in the, the Ruhr area in, in West, Western Germany. But it was also a repertoire for Volksbühne, uh, uh, the theater in Berlin. It was um, another collaboration between me and the director, Omar Absada, who are long-term collaborators. Also the set designer, Bissan Sharif, um, with, with great Syrian actors. Um, 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 uh, this, uh, the premiere was in August 2018. Uh, I have to say one thing, like in this play, I, I actually felt I'm more like an investigative reporter than a, playwright to be honest because the amount of interviews and digging and meeting people and asking to meet people and uh, trying to reach people uh, those who many refuse to speak because as uh, you can imagine when the, when the case is still in court and when still many things are still um, under investigation you would imagine how people are very careful or sometimes unwilling to speak to you, even if you are a theater maker or just a playwright. And when they know that you don't have any authority or power, you know, you, I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not, uh, I'm not even a journalist, even like. But even though that was very difficult, but at the same time, it it shows me, it, show, it showed me like uh, another way of doing theater, honestly. So I I, I owe this experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, it's. Um, I don't know if it's uh, maybe it's difficult to to speak I uh, to describe uh, how we stage it, but so uh, it's of course Omar and Bisan how they vision the text or how they uh, found ways, uh, in my opinion, brilliant way to translate this uh, complicated, I admit it, text which combined a lot of information, but at the same time, a lot of imagination, you know. So they went to a kind of a mixture between an abstract uh, realization, but at the same time, um, uh, um, sometimes a clear references uh, to, to the situations uh, using a, a video, but also I think what was brilliant in the way they staged it, uh, uh, again, Omar, the director, and Bissan, is how they made, uh, because the play, how I built it was based on, uh, uh, multiple narratives by different uh, characters. Each one is speaking his own way, uh, his, sorry, his own version. So, uh, and that was challenging. How do you allow people who are, we are convinced that they are 
uh, very much involved in these uh, human rights violations, but how can you make their arguments stand strong? You know, because I think this is also essential in creating strong drama and creating strong theater. And I think Omar and Bisan found, uh, in my opinion, a brilliant way to transform this into stage. Because uh, for me, I was I was also afraid that uh, this this um, how to say this wouldn't be clearer uh, clear enough in in the way you stage this play. That again, I built it on uh, different characters. Uh, narrating the story from entirely different perspectives. So at the end of the day, you have the same outcome, but everybody is telling it from different angle and everybody trying to defend his or her position. Uh, I think that was, um, that was uh, yeah, our main thing of how we can unfold this on stage uh, and keep each uh, position standing strong and allow audience themselves to reach their own conclusion and to uh, to um, yeah to to even be be uh, hopefully being more provoked to go and uh, dig deeper themselves to find what is behind uh, lafarge and what be, what is behind the practices of multinational not just in multinational companies like lafarge not just in syria but elsewhere again i think lafarge case in syria is just one example it's a very ugly one but it's just a reminder of this evil uh, alliance between uh, capital and uh, dirty capital and dirty politics I would say. yeah